Thank you all who have come. Um, this is the third presentation in a series um, that we're calling Building Blocks of the Minnesota Labor Movement. Uh, the first presentation uh, focused on the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the big event of the uh, Great Northern Railroad Strike of the spring of 1894, uh, which had a central role in the creation of the national holiday of Labor Day. Um, and we had uh, looked at uh, the sort of the concept of the labor movement as consisting of multiple kinds of organizations, not just unions, um, but at that time in the late 19th, early 20th century, also mutual benefit societies, reform organizations, like the organizations fighting for the eight hour day, um, producer and consumer co-ops, um, and even political parties. Uh, and we looked a bit at the formation of the Minnesota Farmer Labor Party in 1924 um, and its rise to power in the 1930s. Uh, in the second presentation, uh, we looked at the period from the 30s through the 1980s. Um, the breakthrough through major strikes uh, in the early 30s, um, the Independent Union of All Workers, which started in the Hormel plant in Austin, but spread not only across Minnesota, but across the Midwest. And in 1934, the Minneapolis Teamsters, who had three major strikes, um, leading ultimately to the political pressure that led Congress in Washington to enact the National Labor Relations Act um, in 1935, also known as the Wagner Act, and also led the uh, labor movement to rethink and re-embody uh, union structures, uh, moving away from exclusively craft unions uh, to industrial unions, like the packing house workers, the steel workers, the auto workers, um, and so on. Um, but uh, the law left out public employees, which we'll talk more about today, um, left out public employees, domestic workers, and farm workers uh, because of a series of kind of political machinations in your prototypical smoke-filled back rooms. Um, and uh, not only uh, did this upheaval in the mid-30s uh, lead to national legislative change um, with the National Labor Relations Act, but also prompted the federal government and many American political and economic institutions to adopt an approach to economic growth regulation um, called Keynesianism, named for the British economist John Maynard Keynes, that emphasized the idea that by generating demand, uh, which could be generated by workers earning enough money to buy the products they build, to buy houses and automobiles, um, also generating demand through the federal government and state government, uh, undertaking projects of economic development, uh, building highways, bridges, um, schools, hospitals, um, and demand-driven economics, again, also known as Keynesianism, became the economic orthodoxy in the United States and in much of the world um, from the mid-1930s um, up to the election of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher um, in the early 1980s. So those are things that we've looked at uh, so far. And what I want to do today is look at a, a new framing of political economic uh, growth 
regulation or deregulation um, that has come to be called neoliberalism, replacing Keynesianism, as some of its advocates have said, replacing demand-driven economics with so-called supply-side economics, the idea to make things as cheaply as possible, and that meant to try to lower taxes, uh, to lower um, government expenses, um, and above all, uh, to lower labor costs. Um, and we see that, and we'll talk some about this today, um, led the American political economic framework to move in an anti-union uh, direction, uh, away from the tolerance of unions that we saw in the 50 years in which Keynesianism was the economic orthodoxy. So, as I said, um, public employees were left out of the National Labor Relations Act which meant that they did not legally have a right to unionize, to bargain collectively, to go on strike. Um, and uh, this would begin to change in the later 1960s into the 1970s. And interestingly, if we go back to the concept that I was pushing about the late 19th and early 20th century, that the labor movement consists of more than just unions, includes other kinds of organizations, that we would see that the energy, thrust, desire of public employees to become unionized and to have the same rights as employees in the private sector, that this was really energized by the anti-Vietnam War movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, that all broiled American society in the mid to late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, we had a very interesting uh, window on this process uh, just two weeks ago at the Eastside Freedom Library when we hosted a panel discussion of former graduate employee union members from the University of Wisconsin which was actually the first group of graduate employees anywhere in the United States to unionize, strike, and gain the right to have a union and function as a union. This was the so-called TAA, Teaching Assistance Association. And we had a short movie to look at, and then we had five panelists who had participated in organizing that union. And they explained that they had been inspired by the anti-Vietnam War movement, the civil rights movement, the women's and gay rights movements, um, and that they had been motivated initially by their desire to have more of a voice in curriculum and the delivery of education at the University of Wisconsin. It led them to organize a formal union in 1968 and to go on strike in 1971. They were initially an independent standalone union, but in 1974, they decided to affiliate with the AFT the American Federation of Teachers. And interestingly, of the five people on our panel two weeks ago, all of whom had been on a track to get PhDs and become academics, 
that all five of them, because of their experiences with the TAA, ended up spending the rest of their lives in the labor movement rather than becoming academics. One of them, Dave Newby, went on in the mid-1980s to be, to be elected president of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO. So they really became central to the labor movement in Wisconsin. There's a great story about African-American sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, who organized in 1968 and went on strike, the strike that would bring Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Memphis, where he would ultimately be assassinated in April of 1968. But these were workers demanding the right to have a recognized union, to bargain collectively, and if need be, to go on strike. There's an absolutely wonderful documentary film that you can find on YouTube called At the River I Stand. You want to see one great film about the labor movement. That's it. At the River I Stand. We also saw in this period of the 60s and early 70s, the emergence of an organization called Nine to Five which was an organization of women in both the private and public sectors organizing. The Wilmer Eight here in Minnesota played a critical role in inspiring other women to unionize, organize, try to make their lives better. In the spring of 1970, Teachers in Minneapolis engaged in an illegal strike because they did not, as public employees, have the right to strike here in Minnesota. They went out for 20 days in the month of April. This was really part of a wave of strikes locally, mostly in the private sector, and also an awareness of teachers' strikes in 1970 in California, Texas, and Tennessee. Minneapolis teachers had great support from parents and students. If you have followed any of this, uh, you might know uh, that there was this marvelous picture from April of 1970 of a 10-year-old African-American kid named Prince Rogers Nelson, who would later burst on the popular culture scene as Prince, standing on a picket line in North Minneapolis, holding a sign supporting his teachers. So this was a remarkable event. Uh, there is a book about to be published by the University of Minnesota Press by Bill Green uh, called Strike with an exclamation point about the teacher's strike. An important consequence of that strike was in the election of 1970, in the fall of 1970, Minneapolis teachers led other public employees in becoming intensely involved in state politics, leading to I don't think they called it a trifecta in 1970, but that was what happened. The DFL gained control of both houses and the governor's seat. And in 1971, passed the Public Employee Labor Relations Act, PELRA, the act that made it legal for Minnesota public employees to organize, to bargain, to strike if necessary. Ironically, this kind of breakthrough coincided with the shift in national politics, discourse, decision-making 
that was moving away from Keynesianism and moving towards neoliberalism. You might remember, probably most of you are too young to remember personally, but you might have seen, heard, read that Ronald Reagan ran for president in the fall of 1980, where one of his major campaign promises was that he was going to strangle government to make it small enough to fit in a bathtub. This was a hostility to unions that we had not seen in the United States since before the labor upsurge of the 1930s. And of course, Reagan would practice what he preached by busting the professional air traffic controllers union in the summer of 1981. Some of you may have seen um, last week, I believe, there was a front page article in the New York Times that expanded into two full additional pages inside the first section of the Times about what a mess our national air control system is. And there was only a brief mention in the article that we might understand some of this crisis in air traffic control as having started with the busting of PATCO, the firing of 14,000 air traffic controllers, and that the system has never caught up in terms of staffing, in terms of work rules, in terms of protections for workers, so that people are overworked, underpaid, stressed, and not providing the kind of safety that we really need. So this was a big turning point in 1980. And we would see this attack uh, go on in the private sector, a real emblematic series of events right here in Minnesota, in Austin, when Hormel workers went on strike in August of 1985 and were permanently replaced in January of 1986, when the National Guard, dispatched to Austin by a DFL president, Rudy Perpich, bringing permanent replacement workers through the picket lines and ultimately breaking the strike in Austin. A couple of years later, we would see similar events in Detroit with the Detroit newspaper strike, in Decatur, Illinois, when Staley corn processing workers went on strike. And we would see large corporate employers demand concessions from their unionized workers to take wage cuts, to pay a higher share of health benefits, to see lower tiers introduced. That's not tiers that run from the eyes, tiers as in levels of workers, hierarchical levels, paying newly hired workers less than workers who had been on the job longer. In the 1990s, we would see Congress pass the North American Free Trade Agreement, promoted by and signed by Bill Clinton. And we would see then globalization playing a major role in this turn away from Keynesianism and turn towards neoliberalism. And so woe unto the public employees who had only just gotten on the bus of unionism at a time when all the road signs were beginning to shift away from workers being able to expect middle-class status and ability to buy homes and cars, 
to send kids to college. And suddenly, just as public employees are gaining the right to organize, gaining the right to bargain, gaining the right to strike if need be, suddenly they're under attack. All workers and all unions are under attack. In the fall of 2001, Minnesota public employees would go on strike, members of MAPE and AFSCME, striking when the state bargainers offered minuscule wage increases, proposed that workers pay an increased share of their health care, and 30,000 30,000 public employees would go on strike in Minnesota, members of both MAPE and AFSCME, the largest strike in the history of the state of Minnesota. Jesse Ventura was the governor, no great friend of unionized workers. This was just on the wake of 9-11, of the, the horrible attack in New York and central Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. And interestingly, public employees from New York, particularly firefighters, came to Minnesota during the public employee strike to express their support. And the strike ended with public employees in Minnesota winning a little bit better of a wage increase, a little bit less of an increased cost of health insurance, some, some improvements. And then 18 years later, 17 years later, the United States Supreme Court would issue a ruling in the Janus, J-A-N-U-S, in the Janus case, where a public employee in the state of Illinois had sued that he should not be compelled to pay dues to his AFSCME local because they were spending some of that money to do political lobbying and to support some candidates, those that were pro-union, as opposed to other candidates who were anti-union. And the Supreme Court ruled that public employees could not be compelled to join a union, that public employees could not be compelled to pay what were called agency fees, that public employees would have the quote unquote freedom not to be represented by unions at all. And so public employees today in 2023 find themselves faced with the challenge of needing to be continuously organizing to convince their fellow workers to join the union, pay their dues, and enjoy not only the representation that union membership brought, but also participation in the democracy of voting, making motions, taking part in debates at union meetings and gatherings. Union leaders in the public sector are continuously working to keep organizing and draw more people in. We are still in a moment where the dominant um, political discourse and political practice continues to be neoliberalism. And it's funny, I, as I've used this term in presentations now for 20 odd years, there's usually somebody who says, why do you call it that? It doesn't sound very liberal. It really sounds pretty conservative. And it's, it's liberal in the sense that Adam Smith 
and John Locke used the term liberal in the 18th century to distinguish a way of organizing political and economic life that was different from feudalism. And, and when I use the word feudalism, I, I sort of swallow hard for a moment because there's a guy running for president in the United States who would like to bring us back to a kind of feudalism. But we're also living in a moment where there is a great deal of new energy and hope in the labor movement. Starbucks workers, Trader Joe's workers, here in the Twin Cities, Vertical Endeavors workers, First Avenue workers, that we're seeing workers organizing at the Science Museum of Minnesota, at the Minnesota Historical Society. So both in the public sector and the private sector, we are in the midst of a great wave of new organizing. And it's connected again with other movements, the movement for a ceasefire in the Middle East, um, the, the movement for uh, to protect Ukraine from Russian invasion, the movement to protect women's rights to protect their bodies. That we're in the midst of, again, a moment of upheaval and the new energies flowing in the labor movement and the new people coming into the labor movement are part and parcel of this new movement. Even if not everybody agrees about every issue, the energy is exciting and new. So um, I'm, I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions or comments um, that that anyone would like to to raise or make. I don't know, Michael or Janaya, you see anything in the chat? Um, yep. There please. is one question so far. Yeah. Um, this is from, uh, this question is, sorry, I may have missed it. But what was it like in the 50s and 60s? Was that during the civil rights movement or was that a time of segregation? I.e., think of the example of black only water fountains versus white only water fountains. So it's the 50s and 60s would be worth a whole course of their own. Um, it's pretty interesting and complicated. Uh, in 1944, uh, Hubert Humphrey, then mayor of Minneapolis, would engineer the merger of the Democratic and Farmer Labor Parties. So the Minnesota Farmer Labor Party, as a so-called third party, had a run from its founding in 1924 to its incorporation with the Democrats in 1944. In 1948, well, let me back up one more thing. In 1944, a remarkable African-American woman named Nellie Stone Johnson would become the first African-American elected to the Minneapolis School Board. Nellie, for years, had been the elevator operator at the Minneapolis Athletic Club. She became an activist in the Farmer Labor Party. She had a close relationship with Hubert Humphrey. And in 1948, Humphrey would run for senator as the DFL candidate and would be one of the most outspoken advocates of civil rights in the United States. And so the DFL and particularly the influence of Nellie Stone Johnson and her colleagues really made the DFL a national leader on civil rights. At the same time, the Cold War, McCarthyism, anti-communism began to grow in the United States and here in Minnesota. For instance, one of the most significant unions 
was the United Electrical Workers Union, which was regularly being red baited and represented 4,000 workers at Honeywell. They would be driven out of Honeywell, replaced by another union. So the Cold War also had an impact in the labor movement. And in the 60s, as concern with civil rights grew nationally, so in, well, let me, let me back up and tell one other story, right? So 1963 is the March on Washington. We typically associate that with Dr. King, it's where he gave his I Have a Dream speech. We know that John Lewis, um, who had been an activist in Alabama uh, in the civil rights movement in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and a leader in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, John Lewis played a critical role in organizing that march, and A. Philip Randolph, who was then the executive director of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, also played a major role in organizing the March on Washington. Three Twin Cities African-Americans played a critical role in launching that March on Washington. They were Maceo Finney, an organizer for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Maceo Littlejohn, an organizer for the Dining Car Waiters Union, and Frank Boyd, who had been an activist in both the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters uh, and the Packing House Workers of America. Um, some of you might know that there is a park in St. Paul at the corner of Selby and Western named for Frank Boyd with a gorgeous bronze bust of Mr. Boyd in the park, that these three African-American activists work closely with A. Philip Randolph. And I recently came across a reference that Frank Boyd actually introduced A. Philip Randolph to Dr. King. So local folks in the labor movement, and again, how these movements are connected, the civil rights movement and the labor movement, the women's movement with the group from the Wilmer Eight. Let me, let me follow that thread for a moment. 1978, eight women at a bank in Wilmer, Minnesota organize a union and go on strike. Their primary issue is that they've been asked to train the men who would become their bosses. And they said, what about some of us getting promoted? And they organized, interestingly, with the United Auto Workers Union. And they went on strike. Their strike inspired women who worked as clerical and technical workers at the University of Minnesota to organize themselves into what would become AFSCME Local 3800 and AFSCME Local 3937, two unions that have been extraordinarily active on issues of American economic policy, American military policy, foreign policy, these have been particularly energetic and active unions who were inspired by the women in Wilmer, Minnesota. So again, these movements were not, quote unquote, outside the labor movement. These were movements that people who worked for wages and salaries, who worked for employers in both the private and public sectors, participated in these movements, learned skills of public speaking, writing pamphlets, putting out newsletters, doing one-on-ones in conversations with people they wanted to interest in joining the organization, that these experiences and these skills 
and these values all became part of the upsurge of the public employee part of the labor movement in the 1970s and early 1980s. So all of it is of a piece. Okay, other questions? Yep, Come. I have another one coming up. I did just want to say, it's funny you mentioned that you could do a whole class on the 50s and 60s. I went to undergrad at U of M Morris and they actually did have a class on the uh -huh. 60s. Uh -huh. It was taught by Roland Guyot, but... Um, yeah, anyways, our next question comes, uh, uh, says, given the huge changes in support from labor seen from the 80s through Janus, what are the hopes to have Janus overturned by Congress and permit unions to collect fees from all employees represented by the union where one works? Um, I, I think that that continues to be a goal. Um, I think that if, if we have watched any of the dysfunction in Congress in the last week, in the last six months, in the last year plus, uh, it would be pretty optimistic, I think, to expect uh, to be able to get a bill through Congress uh, that would overturn Janus um, it's of course extremely unlikely that the Supreme Court will change their mind uh, or that Congress would allow the president to expand the Supreme Court and add three people who might counterbalance the conservative wing. Um, I think that for the foreseeable future, the future of public employee unions rests in the hands of public employees. You have to do the one-on-ones. You have to talk with the people that you work with. You have to organize events, programs, activities that will encourage people who are not members of the union to become members. I don't think we're going to get a legal breakthrough. We have to keep doing the hard work. But I, I should say, I'm, I'm one of those guys that studied labor history and, 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 and read labor history and thought that when the unions in the late 1930s and 1940s began to win a dues checkoff, that is that dues would be deducted from members' paychecks and shop stewards or organizers or staff or whomever might have the responsibility would not have to go out into the workplace every month and collect those dues face to face. I thought that that was a loss for labor. I thought that the need to have those conversations, the value of hearing from a fellow worker that they had an issue and they wanted to have their issue addressed, that we should not have lost that pathway to communications. And I've had lots of experienced people in the labor movement tell me that I'm just some effete intellectual snob sitting in academia, which I was, um, encouraging them to go out and collect those dues and have those difficult conversations. But I actually think that having to talk about union to the people that we work with is actually a healthy thing. Um, and you may also think I'm in a feed intellectual snob um, and throw your shoes at me. But I urge you, go have those conversations. It will be better for everybody. Have I outworn my welcome, Michael? No, 
No, sorry. <laughs> I was just, um, there's a couple more questions here. Sure. Uh, there's one that I, so there's two that I'm going to um, answer a little bit out of order. One is from our president, Robert Johnson. And he says, you know, I lived through those times that he, um, that you were talking about with the civil rights movement and stuff and learned the importance of unions and civil rights. And right. so I think that was just a comment about, and Thank I think you. that's a really important, um, a really important thing to know. Um, so thank you, Robert. Then there's another question about what are your thoughts on union dues used for political activism? Is this something that could be taken out of the way dues are used? If this was an issue with Janice V asked me, I do want to quickly interject before you answer to make something very clear. MAPE dues are not used for supporting particular candidates. For example, your MAPE dues do not go to, if MAPE endorses Waltz for re-election, they don't go to any donations MAPE might make to that um, entity. I do want to note, though, too, that it is important for unions to be involved in the political agenda writ large. Um, there's that, I think there's that saying from um, the social justice and civil rights movement of like, if you're um, not at the table, you're on the menu. Yeah. <laughs> And so I just wanted to quickly make Thank that you. note, though, that yeah. MAPE dues are not used to support political candidates. That would actually be illegal in terms of how MAPE is filed as, uh, like, um, as an organization. Only the PAC can do that. But you could answer more generally. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that um, I love the idea that the solution to lack of democracy is more democracy that we can go to a union meeting and make a motion to do whatever we think the union should do. We can have lots of conversations that the with the people that we work with to convince them that our way of seeing that issue is the right way and that they should come to the union meeting also to vote in favor of the motion that I intend to make at the next union meeting. And that if people are upset by those decisions, they can go have conversations with the people that they work with and come to the next union meeting and make a motion to rescind whatever action might have been taken at the last meeting. So democracy, democracy, democracy. And when you think about the decisions that your managers, your employers, the decisions that they make that you don't get to vote on, that are not decided democratically, that when people think, why should I join the union? or what a waste of time and money the union is. They have more of an opportunity to shape what the union does than they have to shape anything else about their work. And so we just need to keep encouraging people, if you disagree with me, come to the meeting. If you disagree with me and want to change a policy, Convince a bunch of other people that you're right and they should come to the meeting and vote along with you. Democracy, democracy, democracy. And I think that, that we could all do a better job of explaining to the people that we work with, those who might be hostile, skeptical, apathetic, that we can explain to them how much more control they could have over their work lives if they got involved with the union. And there is no better selling point than that. Yep, I think that totally makes sense. And to further highlight your point with some MAPE specific information, Delegate Assembly is our union's highest decision-making body. That's where things like the dues increase that we talked about in previous business meetings gets voted on. That's where a lot of these high level things come. And it's a democratic 
event. And it's one where we almost never have a contested election. We actually don't even have um, that. We have to not, we have to appoint people. And so I would encourage folks, if you really feel like you want to make changes in the union, if you think we're not doing something right, work with us and work to change it through, um, yeah, through democracy. So thank you for that, Peter. And then we have two, um, this is the same person. So I'm going to read both of them back to back. The first one is, um, why are there so many older people opposed to labor, given all the great things that came out of the late 40s and 50s, resulting in the middle class? It seems most folks are only looking out for themselves rather than the common good. He then also says, I lived through these times and participated in those actions to improve people's lives. Long live labor and unions. <laughs> well, I, I think that, and here I'm going to take some of the responsibility we do a terrible job in the United States of educating students about labor. We don't do a very good job of educating students about racism, sexism, homophobia. These are all the things that we know that folks in Florida, Georgia, Texas are trying to make sure that we don't teach this stuff to kids. But it's also that we're not teaching kids labor history. Um, I'm having a wonderful time right now at the Eastside Freedom Library. It is National History Day season. And we are seeing wonderful 12, 13, 14 year olds coming into the library, doing projects, taking ownership of telling the story of the Strutwear Knitting Strike of 1935 that got the National Hosiery Workers Union to admit women who had been excluded. The 1970 Minneapolis Teachers Strike that led to the passage of Pelra. Another young woman is, is, is working on Dolores Huerta and her role in the United Farm Workers of California and the passage of a Farm Workers Labor Relations Act in California that gave them the right to organize. And so I find when we're able to put labor history in front of kids, they're ready to get in it up to their elbows and are fascinated by the stories. These are stories with drama and passion and energy and hope. And yet most of the curriculum leaves these stories out. And I'm, I'm thrilled that for the last year and a half, I have been on the St. Paul Public Schools Critical Ethnic Studies Steering Committee. And I'm also presenting monthly to the executive board of the St. Paul Federation of Educators about the history of race and racism and its relationship to the labor movement. So I'm hopeful that we're gonna move the needle in St. Paul and maybe we're moving the needle in the whole state of Minnesota now that the legislature this past session passed a bill requiring ethnic studies to be taught throughout the state of Minnesota. Most of the superintendent school boards and principals have no idea what ethnic studies is. How can we make ethnic studies include class and gender and sexual orientation, as well as race and ethnicity? How can we see those things as connected? And, and I'm very excited to be around people who are trying to make those things happen introduce them to the curriculum and prepare teachers to teach it. Um, so it's hard if people have grown up not knowing these stories and not knowing this history and then expecting them to teach it. We're going to get the same old, same old if we're not intervening. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm a perennial optimist on on all of this.
tell. There's an, another question. I almost wonder if it's tongue in cheek because I, I've definitely have heard this question asked a lot of times, especially given some of the decisions of our Reese of our governor and some of the particular vetoes that he made. But what happened to the farmer labor portion of the DFL? Yeah, um, in 1991, I was very involved with railroad workers who were trying to build solidarity, whether they were clerks who worked in the office or the engineer who drove the train or the conductor or switchman, trainman, maintenance of way worker. We were trying to bring all those workers together and in April of 1991, workers went on strike. The strike lasted 17 hours. Congress intervened under the terms of the National Railway Labor Act of 1926, imposed an, a, a, the right noun is neither agreement nor settlement. They imposed terms of a contract on the workers Workers were furious, and a bunch of workers put money together and put up two billboards in St. Paul along Shepherd Road, and the billboard said, DFL must mean definitely failed labor. It was a moment of great cynicism and frustration uh, for railroad workers. And... Uh, and I think that the merger of the Democratic and farmer labor parties led to less and less voice for farmers and workers. Um, but again, these institutions are internally democratic. And if we are dissatisfied with how they're behaving, the answer is to get more involved and to convince more people like us to get involved and to change the direction and policies. I, 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 will, I will say I'm furious that Governor Waltz vetoed the patient staffing bill that the Minnesota Nurses Association was advocating for because the, the Mayo Clinic had threatened to close up shop and run away from Minnesota. And then before the ink was even dry on that veto, Governor Waltz also vetoed the bill that would have given rights to organize and established minimum standards for Uber and Lyft drivers. I'm furious that those things were done by Governor Waltz. We need to get more people elected to the legislature to make sure that pro-labor bills are veto-proof, regardless of who the governor might be. It's a democracy. We ought to be able to do that. Thank you, Peter. I just put some um, uh, notes in the chat. So I first just want, I'll just read those through. Uh, if you want more info about the Eastside Freedom Library, I posted the link there. They do regular events. They're an amazing space. I really can't give them credit, enough credit for what they do for the community, like having Peter here, for example. Um, also, please consider if you're not a member and you're MAPE represented, joining MAPE. I think Peter did a really good job of talking about the importance of being a paying member, especially in the post AFSME or in the post Janus world. So please consider joining. Um, and then just as a final reminder, for those of you who are uh, MAPE at Deed, please attend the town hall tomorrow from 12 to 1. Great. Michael, thank you so much. Um, let me urge everyone, if you have kids that are doing National History Day projects, send them to the Eastside Freedom Library. We have a team of great mentors, and we, we offer a workshop every Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon. Send us your kids. Um, and please do take a look at our website. You can make a donation if you want. Um, but send us your kids. Um, it's been a great pleasure to talk with you guys. And 
Michael and Janiyah, if you ever want me back, just ask. We definitely can. Thank you so much, Peter, for Thank coming. You. I'm I've gotten so much positive feedback about this labor series. They've been really happy to have. I think our folks have been really happy to have you. Um, please join us, Mape folks, in February, where we will potentially actually be screening that movie that Peter just talked oh, about great. um at the river I stand. Great. Because it is one hour long and three dollars to rent. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. Have a good yep. holiday and, and stay safe and well, everybody. Thank you. Yep. You too. See Take you care. all later. Thank you.